All right. Sorry okay. about that, everybody. Great. Um, well, I'm thrilled now that we're recording um, to introduce the second of the, the PCAL alumni series speakers um, for this semester or year, I believe, Dr. John A. Um, Dr. K received his master's in folk studies here at WKU in 1997. Mm. He went on to public folklore, public so sector folklore work um, in a number of places here in Kentucky, um, a number of years in Florida, before returning to his home state of Indiana in 2004 um, to become the director of Traditional Arts Indiana, which is based at Indiana University. Um, he received his PhD in folklore from Indiana University, and in addition to directing TA at Traditional Arts Indiana, he also serves as an associate professor there in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology. Um, just this past year in 2020, he was awarded an Indiana University Bicentennial, Bicentennial Medal for his service to the state and to the university. So congratulations, John, on all those and many Absolutely. more accomplishments. <laughs> um, Thank you. John conducts research and, um, and delivers public programming on many topics, many genres of folklore with many audiences. Um, but, and he has produced um, more than 60 exhibitions and 30 documentary films on a range of arts related topics. Tonight, we will hear from him about his research and his applied folklore work at the intersection of folklore, the arts and gerontology through which he highlights how the creative pra practices of older adults contribute to their quality of life. Um, related to this, and I believe he will mention, um, he has a number of, uh, a couple of books, um, a single authored book called Folk Art and Aging, Life Story Objects and Their Makers, an edited volume, The Expressive Lives of Elders, and um, he's the lead author on a resource guide, Memory Art and Aging. Um, those links are um, in the chat and I'll put them in again a little bit later because um, both the Folk Art and Aging and the resource guide are available for free as downloads. Um, and the resource guide is available for free as a, um, in print copy as well. Um, so quick, a couple of quick Zoom notes. Um, please keep your microphone muted during John's presentation. Um, if you aren't sure how to do that down at the, the bottom left corner where it says mute, you can just click that and it will mute your microphone and that way we can all hear John. Um, please, if you have questions during the presentation, you can drop them into the chat at any time. Um, at the end, we will, of course, have time for question and answers, both through the chat and, of course, through um, raising your Zoom hands. Um, and so we will have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, as I said earlier, note that we are recording. Um, so if you don't want your face on the recording, please be sure and mute your, your video later as well. Um, thank you so much to Potter College of Arts and Letters and particularly to Kelly Scott. Um, for coordinating this series um, and bringing attention to the research and creative activities of, um, the, of Potter College alumni. Um, thanks as well to our folk study student, Taylor Burden, for her help with social media on this and, and all that we do in folk studies. Um, and thank you most of all to John Kay for joining us tonight. And John, um, again, welcome. Thank you for continuing to be such a big supporter of our program and all that we do. So I turn it over to you now. I am going to make sure everybody's muted as we get started here, except for John, including me. So thank you all so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, I just want to say before I get started here how great it is to see everybody. Uh, this is my fourth talk, I think, that I've given at WKU in about a month. Uh, so I was talking with one of my uh, colleagues at IU and I said, well, I'm just so busy. And he goes, says, well, you're working for two universities. Uh, so it's kind of feels like that. But I, I can't think of a place that I have a, a warmer place in my heart for than WKU and the folk studies uh, program. Uh, just really lucky uh, for the campus to have and for the college to have such a, a stellar program that's really nationally and internationally known and to have colleagues uh, that are there doing the work uh, and training up that next generation of folklorists. And I just feel really, really strongly about the good work that the people at WKU uh, are doing. And I'm thankful 
that they keep inviting me back uh, to do these things. I, I'm gonna share my screen uh, now, but while I'm doing that, um, oh, sorry, wrong one. Um, there we go. Um, while I'm doing that, um, I should say, uh, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, I want to say that it's really been, uh, it, it seems like it was only yesterday that I was there as I was talking with Laura Harper Lee, uh, kind of learning from uh, WKU and be, really gaining my entree into the field of folklore there. I thought I knew what folklore was. I didn't know what being a folklorist was uh, until I went to Western Kentucky University. And I'm just so thankful that I was able to uh, get a leg up and get started. And it really was a, a pretty amazing time. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today uh, is based on my work here in Indiana. Uh, but I can honestly say that my work really began when I was in Kentucky, uh, learning from some of those older tradition bearers uh, that uh, I got to know when I when I was working during the summer, my first between my first year and my second year, of my master's degree. I got to do a, a job with the Kentucky Folklife Program, which is now based at Western Kentucky University, not in state government anymore. But uh, I was able to use my connection there to go over to Eastern Kentucky and to do field work uh, and meet people like uh, fiddler James Espen Honeycutt or Mossy Muncie, who made these wonderful corn shuck dolls, or Olin Callen, who was the first oak basket maker I ever had ever met. Uh, and uh, it was just really wonderful experience. Uh, but one of the people, this guy on my right here, uh, uh, Damon Helton, was really kind of a special person to me. Uh, he became kind of this, uh, my, my kind of uh, surrogate grandfather for or at least a few weeks one summer when I was over there documenting traditional arts. I showed up at his house uh, and he took me in and he really kind of taught me a lot uh, about uh, the local community. And he also let me learn how to be a folklorist by talking with him. And I think it was perhaps back then that I started thinking a little bit at least about the traditional arts in the later life. Because all of these people, I was, I was running around during the middle of the day. Who else was I going to find at home uh, besides older adults? Uh, and so I got to go and spend time with these, uh, with these older adults and to learn about their crafts and about their music and about their stories and about local history. And it really was a, a fantastic time. And so I would have never experienced that uh, if I had not been at Western Kentucky University. And I'm, I'm thankful for that work. Well, that was where I started, but uh, I uh, have worked lots of places. I'm now the state folklorist here in Indiana. Uh, and I do lots of public programs. Uh, I was talking with Anne beforehand. One of the things that folklorists do, and we get known for doing these kind of artistic activities where we pre are presenting traditional artists. And one of the things I've become uh, kind of known for is hosting demonstrations with people at state parks and at the state fair and at community centers and that sort of thing. Uh, and I remember I was at a, I was at a state park and we were doing a limestone carving workshop and uh and out of the corner of my eye i saw glenn hall uh and glenn hall uh, came up to me and i i'd done a program with him a, a couple years earlier uh and uh, i said to uh, hey mr hall long time no see and his daughter says well he made me bring him here to see you and i said what, what was that why uh, and i go well why would you want to do uh, why would you want to do that when was that and she he goes it was May the 5th, 2015. And his daughter looked at him. She goes, how did you remember that? And he goes, well, it was just about the best day of my life. Uh, and it was then that it really became solidified in my mind that the work that we do, where I had him there doing demonstrations, doing his metalwork demonstrations and talking to visitors to the park and to school kids uh, for them. But it was just as much about him being able to be there and how that enriched his life. Uh, and so I began really thinking in earnest about 
the work that we do as being able to create a platform for traditional artists to share this and to, to experience uh, those types of, have those type of experiences. Uh, I have a lot that I could talk about for, with you today. Uh, in fact, I had three other lectures that I've done on adjacent topics, and I've tried to make them all very different. Uh, and so this one, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's in my first book, uh, Life Story Objects. And so uh, the first section, I'm going to talk about life story objects and what those are. Uh, and then I'm going to talk uh, briefly about resiliency and kind of bring that so what? Why, why should we be paying attention to folklore and art in later life? Uh, and then finally, I'm going to round everything up by talking in a little more detail about some of the, the programs and workshops that I've designed uh, based upon this humanities and arts research that I do uh, to help support the quality of life of older adults. So that's what I've got us slated to do for the next uh, 40 minutes or so, if that's all right. Uh, and if I start boring you, just kind of start waving your hands and I'll, I'll try, to, try to move quickly. So when I say life story objects, I, I'm really talking about things that people make. Life story art uh, are things that people make, they collect, they keep, uh, that kind of help them share important life stories. It helps them uh, recall the past. It helps them share those memories with others. It fills the lonely times for them in, in the process of making these things. This is a quilt that was made by my friend Amy Powell. Amy Powell was a quilter up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, worked with the Sisters of the Cloth. And this is a, this is a story quilt. Uh, this is a, a quilt that's a baby quilt. It's a small quilt that she made when her first grandchild was being born uh, right before. And, uh, it has the whole genealogy. She's there in the, the, the kind of center bottom. Uh, and then her parents and siblings, and then her grandparents are there. Uh, and then it's surrounded by these patterns which invoke uh, the Underground Railroad and the story of where people came from. And the quilt tells that story. Why, why did she do that? Why did she make this quilt when she was ready to have uh, a grandchild? It became something for her to think about the legacy, to think about the history. It was something that she could leave as an heirloom to this child, but it was also became a tool for telling her family important life stories. And it's that narrative part that I really want us to kind of focus on a little bit. And I've seen, seen this in countless, countless examples of these life story objects. And, I, uh, and I'll tell you about a few of them. This is my friend, Bill Root. Kara Barnard's here. She probably knows Bill Root. Uh, he's a local guy. I grew up, he built the fence around my parents' yard, uh, or farm, uh, when, uh, when I was a kid. Uh, and uh, when he retired, the first year after he retired, he went to demonstrate at the Indiana State Fair in the Pioneer Village. Uh, and I bumped into him. And I asked him, well, what are you doing, Bill? And he goes, well, they asked me to demonstrate, and they said I could do just about anything I wanted. So I decided I'd make something out of wood since that's what I do. And he goes, this is a replica of the house that I grew up in. And for the next three years, he went to the Indiana State Fair for all three weeks of the fair. And he stayed there and he worked, well, when he wasn't talking with, uh, with all the other folks around, that's a lot, big part of this as well. He got together with those folks and he made this replica just from his memory of the home that he grew up in um, down in Knott County. Uh, and it really became this beautiful uh, uh, piece that he, that he produced. Uh, and he didn't just build the house. He built the rooms, too. He kind of dressed them out. He put in the pictures. He remembered things from that. He even had his childhood home and made up some of his favorite books from his childhood, and he put them on the shelf. And you could just imagine uh, the time that he spent, the hours and hours working on the, each little detail. The thousands of shingles that he split out by hand and glued into place for the roof. Uh, thinking back about what would go in each of the rooms and, and then it was there. But that's only part of it. And then he went through and he put lights in it. Not because the house had the electric lights, uh, but because he wanted people to look in the window and to see the things so he could tell them about what they were seeing and what they were doing. So these objects are not just about creating it and it being done. It's making it with the idea that they're going to be able to share it sometime 
in the future. And I have several of these stories that I can tell you about. Uh, I, one of the first artists I worked with that made these life story objects was my friend John Schoolman. John Schoolman lived to be 100 years old, and he stayed artistically active the whole time. Uh, he, he would spend uh, hours each night when he couldn't sleep uh, working on walking sticks, drawing them, writing poems to inscribe on them, coming up with the patterns, erase and redraw, then wood burning and painting them uh, until he ended up with just these beautiful pieces. Uh, this is just the Christmas collection that's behind him there. Uh, and as he told me, uh, it keeps my mind busy. It keeps me going. It gave himself a purpose. But not only did it give himself a, a purpose with this, uh, you could just imagine his little bitty guy, a little slight of a guy, walking down the, the, the street there in North Webster where he lived, uh, and he had just this get-out-of-town, brightly colored painted walking stick, and he'd be walking down the street, and someone would come up, oh, oh, what a pretty stick. Usually it was a woman that stopped him and said, oh, what a pretty stick. And he'd stop, and he'd lift up the stick to show it to him, but then they would see that on that stick was inscribed a poem or a song or a story that he would read to them or he would sing the song or he would recite the poem. And it was kind of like a fishing lure skimming through the water uh, where the fish bites it. And it's not until it bites that it realizes that it's caught. Uh, and it's the same way with the walking sticks. They're intended to attract people to them. They're intent to, intended to arrest people, get them to stop. Uh, to fight that invisibility that so many older adults are faced with and so many are beset by. Uh, and so his his uh, walking sticks uh, are intended to stop people so that he can tell them important stories, uh, like about his wife who passed away, Ada, uh, when he was just 70 and the 30 years he had to live uh, after that uh, uh, without her. The life that they had together and the stories all written there on his walking stick. The sticks are about cre uh, recalling memories when they're being made, but they're about sharing memories when they're used. And he ended up with this whole treasure trove of walking sticks that he could tap into. And what, depending upon the day and how he felt or what was going on in the world, he would pick out the appropriate stick so that when he got stopped, he would have something that he could tell people and that he could share. So I, I met these, these people who made these life story objects, and I started thinking, I bet there are more people out there that are doing this type of work. Uh, and so I went, uh, I, I went to my friend that worked at an arts agency, and I said, I want to start doing some creative aging workshops. And he says, I don't know what that is, but it sounds good. Let's do it. And so we, we basically organized uh, some show and tells, and we just went into a local senior uh, center in the next town over, over in Columbus, Indiana, near where I, I live. Uh, and we hosted uh, a workshop. Uh, and we had people who brought wood carvings, they brought quilts, they brought their needlepoint, they brought saws that they painted on, they had crochet, all different types of, of traditional arts uh, uh, to share with me. Uh, and there were also some paintings as well, but most of it were, was handicrafts uh, that people produce. But one of the artists, he actually showed up early, was Bob Taylor. Uh, and he poked his head in the door and I said, come on in. And he showed me his work. And he made these just amazing uh, carvings of childhood memories. He called them his memory carvings. And while he had carved since he was eight years old with a little red handle pocket knife that his grandfather gave him, it wasn't until he retired that he started thinking about creating these memory carving carvings that told the story of important life experiences. Uh, like the time he went on his first train ride uh, all the way to Coney Island, uh, going there, the brass band that played, uh, and the family that was there, and uh, the Island Queen ferry boat that took him across the river uh, to, to Coney Island, and the rides that he got to go on. Uh, now, he was, he was just a little kid. He was like six or seven years old, probably, about this time. Um, and now he's in his 80s, uh, but he couldn't remember everything. But that was one of the other parts about these life story objects. In making it, he had to go and 
He went to the local newspaper and said, do you all have any information about this? No, but we can put something in the paper to advertise. And he got to talk with some people at the Historical Society. And then he met other people that went on this ride. And some people had some photographs. And he was able to do that. And he went to the library and gave a talk about these sorts of things. Uh, and it really became powerful for him, not just through the making of this, and not just through the sharing, but actually doing this research created a whole social life for him around this craft. Uh, and so you can see, we often just think about folk art as, oh, what does it look like? Is it hanging there on the wall? But actually these things, these walking sticks and these carvings are doing a wonderful amount of work in the lives of the people who make them. And that's what I'm trying to foreground in a lot of the work that I do. I remember uh, one of the carvings that Bob made was, was this one here, uh, a carving of a dead whale. In fact, I, I, I showed this picture and I told the story and I was, uh, after my book came out, I was in Dallas, Texas giving a book talk and somebody said, I saw that whale uh, just from seeing this wood carving. So I'm going to tell you, tell you the story. So uh, anyway, uh, Bob made this carving. And he would go to uh, various shows, the county fair and places like the, the wood carving show in Franklin. And he would set it up uh, on uh, the table there for people to see. And you'd just see it. People would walk up and they'd look at this carving of a train. And then it's got this big fish, this, this dead whale on the back of the train. And then they'd look over at Bob and they'd look at the dead whale. And then they'd look back over at Bob. Uh, and, uh, and then Bob would get this kind of wry smile. And he called upon, basically, to tell the story. These carvings are intended to be narrated. They paint the person as this teller of history. And they work, uh, they work in that way. Uh, and so, uh, uh, basically, the, the story, because I know you all want to know about it, is uh, a train started out in California. Uh, this, this whale had washed ashore. Uh, uh, entrepreneur back, back during the Depression uh, worked it out to put the, the whale on a railroad car, uh, loaded it down with some salt and stuff, I guess, to try to mummify it. Uh, and it ends up, uh, he ends up traveling all across the United States, charging people a nickel or a dime to go and see this dead whale. Think about it. If you hadn't seen a whale before, that was kind of a, a big deal uh, to get to do. And there was all this other stuff. But Bob remembered uh, this whale uh, uh, and so did uh, these other 80-year-olds that I saw in, uh, in Texas uh, all those years later. So knowing that just kind of organically these, uh, these stories happen, uh, I started doing work with Bob uh, where I'd bring him into the museum where I worked and he would not just carve, he sometimes would carve, but he'd be there to narrate and tell these stories and talk about the work that he's doing and he became... Uh, uh, he became someone that I could kind of uh, lean upon to help me understand about these life story objects a little bit more. But he wasn't the only artist that I work with. This is my friend Marianne Sykes. Marianne does rug cooking. Now, she didn't grow up in, the, in Newfoundland or up on the eastern seaboard where rug cooking is, uh, is a traditional art where it's widespread. Uh, but rug cooking is now a international craft it's something that's done everywhere and uh there just happened to be in uh, chesterton indiana where she was living uh, a rug cooking club uh, and uh, she was a amazingly talented artist and her daughter got her a rug cooking kit and she did this one kit and she thought that was kind of fun uh, but she probably wouldn't have kept hooking rugs except for the fact that there was this club there was a social network uh there for her and so she started making rugs not the ones like the pattern that was in the, the kit that she had but she started making them uh based upon her memories she would draw and redraw reposition things make things smaller and larger choosing what to put in and what to leave out she painted uh, or she created uh, uh rugs uh for about little italy uh the place where she grew up uh in uh, in the, the, being a sicilian American. Uh, she actually was raised in an orphanage, but she enjoyed the time she got to spend with her family in Little e Italy uh, when she wasn't in the orphanage. Uh, she made them about 
uh, festivals. She made them with street scene. She made them of a trip to Chinatown uh, with her grandson, who was Chinese American. Uh, very much the rugs became ways of kind of chronicling uh, important family stories. Uh, she could remember little Italy and about the uh, the knife sharpener that was there and the the cart that would bring around fresh vegetables and the the mother who would always have babies and you talk about there was no air conditioning and there was uh, it was super highway and uh, all this stuff that was there uh, and she talked about how it was dirty and it was it was loud and it was noisy and it was free everything that it wasn't like when she was in the orphanage. Uh, when she was growing up. And so that was a really monumental memory for her. And so she started making these these rugs. Uh, here's one that she made. Um, here's one that she made. Um, My son made a big igloo with his friend. And they had a little dog. They put it at the top and it would run out the bottom. It was one of these little mousy dogs. They called him mousy. And my daughter Barbara was selling two snowballs for five cents so they could throw but uh, kids were playing snowballs hitting everybody and there's the, the street and the police were called several times for the for the igloo on the ground <laughs> the kids were noisy that's where we lived that's where i raised the kids right. these were cold water flats they called them so this was the one i owned with the red door they were narrow buildings, 19 feet wide, 60 feet long. And you raised your kids, it was miserable. Very narrow steps, you know. And so, so each one of these rugs has a story like that that's associated with it. Now, one of the interesting things is that she says, oh, there's where we live, the one with the red door. And I asked her, well, why did you paint your door red? And she goes, oh, our door wasn't red. And I said, well, why, why did you make the door red? And she goes, oh, just so it's easier to point out to people. So these, these images, while they're, they're beautiful to look at, they're beautiful to tell, and they're beautiful to understand. Uh, and so very much the stories are being edited, the scenes are being edited in such a way that they allow the person to be engaged and, and to engage with the, with, with the public around that. Here's, a, here's another one. I, I'm, I'm going to pick up my pace here because I'm running behind. Uh, but this is uh, the, the, basically the same scene, but instead of being the worst snowstorm, this is the 4th of July. And you can see she kind of plays with this scene here. Uh, the kids traded out their, uh, their sparklers and, and, or traded out their, their uh, snowballs and, and, and the like, mittens for sparklers and, and hula hoops and that sort of thing. But she also changed the, the landscape a little bit. If you look at it, this is a very straight scene here in the snow scene. Uh, but when she does it for uh, the 4th of July, she sets the, the, the kind of pointed uh, building back a little bit farther so it looks like a rocket ship. Uh, and she transformed her neighbor who she always called said was very ugly. She said, but I made her pretty because I wanted her to be pretty. Uh, and so she was constantly changing these uh, these things. Oh, one of the things that that people, uh, as they age, uh, they often start to feel as if they can't do things, that they uh, are are helpless. But if you're able to change whole, if you can make things like this, and you can change buildings into rocket ships, and you can transform people, uh, it's a mastery that people have, and they don't have this feeling of helplessness. Uh, this artwork helps them transcend uh, those experiences. And as I said, I, I could tell you lots and lots of stories like uh, about people who do this type of art, like my friend Gus Potoff, who uh, also was raised in an orphanage. And when he was 17, he aged out of the orphanage. And his only thing that was open to him was to join. He was in the, uh, lived on the island of Maluku. Uh, and he was Dutch Indonesian. And so basically, the only option he had was to join the military. Unfortunately, it was at the beginning of World War II. Uh, and he enlisted uh, and to learn to be a tank, uh, a mechanic for a, a tank battalion. Uh, and just a few weeks into his deployment, he was captured. And he spent basically the whole war 
uh, his whole from 17 till like 22 uh, as a prisoner of war, uh, the whole war. And this picture was one of the first paintings he made that tells the story of his transformation. Now, he wasn't just in any uh, prisoner of war camp. Uh, he helped build the Imperial Railroad, uh, the Japanese Imperial Railroad. He helped build the bridge on the River Kwai. You've probably seen the movie. He hated the movie. He said, it, we weren't allowed to whistle. Uh, we weren't allowed to sing. Uh, it, he grieved over burying his friend uh, in a shallow grave. Over 16,000 people died building this railway and, and, the, and the Hellfire Pass and, and, that, uh, and, the, and the bridge on the River Kwai. Really an amazing story. Uh, but Gus didn't paint. Uh, Gus didn't start painting until after he retired. Uh, why did Marianne make rugs? Because there was a local rug hooking show, uh, uh, club. Uh, why was, uh, why did Gus start painting? There was a local museum, a uh, veterans museum. What do you have in museums? Artwork, uh, uh, artifacts, those types of things. Uh, I should tell you, Gus spoke in very broken English a lot of the time, had a very thick accent, uh, and it was really hard to understand him. Uh, and so soon after he started volunteering on Tuesdays at the Veterans Museum, uh, he started making these, these paintings, uh, paintings like this one here that hung there, uh, which is the last camp. Uh, and he'd sit there on a stool next to this painting, and he would tell its story about the... Uh, 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 about uh, the, the day the war came to an end. Now, if you look at this, it doesn't say much about the war coming to end. It's intended to be narrated. There's the, the, the camp, the makeshift camp where they live. There's the Allied forces flags hanging above and then the Japanese flag in the dirt on the ground. And then he launches into the sto uh, story about the Korean guards fleeing into the jungle and about the, the British coming in on a jeep and telling him not to venture out uh, to stay in the camp, and these guys were starving. Uh, and, of course, he snuck out. Uh, and I said, well, why did you sneak out? We were starving. I said, what did you go get? He goes, chicken. I went to get chicken. Uh, and so he went into the village and got himself some chicken to eat. And so all of his stories uh, in, are intended to be narrated. So those are the life story objects. As I said, I could go on for days about life story objects and what they are and the work that they do in helping people to pass time, to get into a state of flow, uh, to find purpose and meaning, uh, to leave a legacy, to, to narrate, uh, all of those things. And perhaps if, uh, uh, if I can come back yet again, I could talk about any one of those in more detail. But well, there are some things I wanted to talk to you about, about my work with folk art and aging. Uh, one of the topics that I've become very interested in is resiliency, uh, because uh, here in Indiana, uh, we recognize that the, there's an international transition that's happening. Uh, for the first time in human history this year, uh, I've been told that people over the age of 65 outnumber the people under the age of five for the first time in human history. Uh, you combine that with the fact that here in Indiana, where I live, uh, people... Uh, the Health and Well-Being Index ranks Indiana 46 out of 50 states in the quality of life of older adults. That's a horrible statistic. Uh, it's not one that I would expect in the Midwest, uh, per se. And so I started thinking about resilience and what people make. And I remember my friend, uh, Nancy Morgan. Uh, and Nancy Morgan, uh, she quilted uh, when I worked in Florida, one of my first jobs out of, uh, out of WKU. Uh, and she did that for years and years while I was there. And then she started complaining about the bursitis in her shoulders and how she couldn't lean over the quilting frame anymore and she was going to have to quilt. And I said, well, you can come and you can sit with everyone and you can visit. No, no, that wouldn't be right. I wouldn't come. I won't, if I can't make a quilt, I'm not going to come pretend I can. Uh, and I, I said to him, well, maybe she had told me about briar stitching and she had, I said, maybe you could do a little, something in a little hand loop. And so she started doing these briar stitching, which was easier on her hands and on her shoulders. And she started doing that. And that's a story of resilience, uh, where someone uh, finds a way to adapt uh, to a new situation in their life. When we talk about resilience, 
it's really easy to think, oh, I could never do what she does. Uh, she's so resilient. That's just so great. Uh, that's not resilience. Uh, resilience, I'm not talking about grit. Uh, that's one thing that's part of that. Uh, but what I'm really talking about are these constellations of resources that people have uh, that they can lean upon. So that could be, if you're rich, uh, you're going to have some resilience. If you've got a large family that's supportive of you, you're going to have some resilience. If you're rich and have that, that's great. If you've got health insurance, that's that contributes to your resilience as an older adult. Uh, if you've got art making that you can do uh, that gives you some purpose and some meaning, that's another aspect of resilience. It gives you something to hold on to when your life just falls apart. Uh, like my friend, uh, here's an example of the... Um, of the briar stitching that Nancy did. That's what happened to my friend, Mary Alice Collins, who was a champion pie baker. She was celebrated for, for 40 years. She made pies at the Indiana State Fair. She became a state fair master. We produced a documentary about her. And a, uh, a few years ago, uh, she was traveling with her husband in South America. Uh, and she uh, developed sepsis, uh, got very gravely sick. They ended up having to cut off all the fingers on both hands. They had to cut off both legs below the knees. Uh, it was just horrific. But you know what? She nursed herself back to health. You would think that you wouldn't want to do anything at that point. But you know that next year? She entered 30 pies in the Indiana State Fair. Why? Why did she do that? because she wanted to be able to communicate to people and to herself that she could still do it, that she was still Alice Collins, Mary Alice Collins. She wanted to communicate that to people. Uh, and so that year and for several years, she had to lean upon her husband to help her do the lattice work on the, on the pies that she made uh, and to, uh, to help her uh, get things in and out of the oven. Uh, but she continued to be able to do what she uh, this pie baking up until last year or two years ago now uh, uh, when she finally passed away. Uh, I think it was three or four years she continued to make pies for the Indiana State Fair. So I believe that the traditional arts are kind of community proven strategies uh, uh, for older adults to be able to accomplish uh, uh, kind of resilience in later life. And so I've been going about trying to do programs that highlight this type of work. We've been doing a whole slew of public programs and I won't be able to tell you uh, about all of them, but we've been doing these, these summits and, and things that I wanna talk about. We did a memory painting workshop where we were able to highlight some of the work of these life story objects that I've been telling you about where people could paint important picture, uh, pictures of important stories. And they learned from an artist how to do this, but we also talked about memory and, and, and mastery uh, in their work. Uh, Kara Barnard's here. Uh, she actually uh, uh, worked uh, with a group that she calls, she has a program called Silver Strings. We kind of helped her get that program started. She's done it a few times now where she goes into communities and she teaches them to play the dulcimer in a way that's geared towards older adults. And I want you to listen to this uh, a portion of a video that I made uh, with these members of the Silver Strings group, because I think it really catches into this idea of resiliency and sociability uh, and connecting with other people. So let me do this. Um, I've always loved music my whole life, never had the time to pursue it. And I just want to say that it has already majorly improved the quality of my life. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Marta Anderson and my husband Rick and I uh, came to the Dulcimer class. It gave us something to do together. We just recently retired and it's just really been it's something we want to continue. So it's really been great. I came here with a friend because we thought it would be fun, but I think I found my instrument for my lifetime. I love it, and it was easy. Kara was a great teacher, um, and I am going to continue it. We're going to meet as a group and maybe do some gigs, so I'm excited. It's a new part of life. 
I know our first class, we started looking at the music and everything, just sort of a light, little light went off in my head like, yeah. Um, so it's great to get out of the house and use a different part of my brain and uh, never played a string instrument before. And it's, uh, it's simple enough to be simple, but I think it's uh, advanced enough to, you know, there's a, a place to keep going. And it's uh, nice to meet with a bunch of people. Uh, I, I didn't know anybody in this class. Um, I love playing the dulcimer. It's relaxing. Um, the lessons here have just been phenomenal. Kara is awesome. And uh, it gives you um, a purpose as you get older. And just really enjoy it. Recommend it for anyone. So uh, give Kara uh, a clap here uh, as well. She's, uh, she's joined us today. But there are several themes that are, that are there. This idea of right after somebody retires there's an opportunity for them to fill their time how many times do you hear about people who die shortly after they retire because they their work was everything being able to do something in those retirement years becomes a, a theme that emerges uh being able to do something with your spouse to to, to bring you uh, to, uh together a, a little bit more the idea of social engagement being able to make new friends at a time in your life that it's not necessarily easy to make new friends uh, all of those become kind of powerful, um, powerful el elements. So real quickly, uh, before I, I open this up to questions, one of the main things we've been doing are these uh, creative aging summits where we basically, if you remember your childhood, we do these um, show and tells where we ask people to bring examples of their artwork, their stories, their songs they want to sing, and to share them uh, with the group. And we pass a microphone around and we let them have an opportunity to tell those stories. And while they're doing that, uh, I'm following up with stories about how it makes them feel to get together with other people or who do they make their artwork for? How do they share it? Uh, we talk about uh, uh, the three plagues of isolation, boredom and helplessness that beset so many older adults. And that has become just a powerful uh, opportunity for us. Uh, I bring grad students and undergrad students along with me because they love to be able to tell these stories to other people, uh, not just uh, with their peers. Uh, and from the work that we've been doing with these older adults, we have made this resource guide, and Anne, I think it's in the chat if you want to copy that. You can get a free PDF download of this. You can also get, uh, there's a order form, you can get a free copy mailed to you, and we're happy to uh, send you a copy of that. Uh, and so you want to make sure you uh, you fill uh, fill that out to get your own free print copy. Uh, and in these guides, it tells inspiring stories like the one that I told you about Bob Taylor. And then there's an activity like making a memory map uh, that's there with it as well. I tell the story of James John or, or the Heritage Place Ladies of the Dance uh, that uh, that I've worked with. Uh, really. Uh, uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful stories as well as activities to go along with these. And also almost every page, and this is one of the reasons I encourage people to get the PDF too, uh, there are links that in the PDF you can click on them, you can watch video, you can hear people talk, you can see the full version of the, uh, the video of Kara's Silver Strings uh, that we made, and you can engage in that. Uh, and so that's there. Real quickly, uh, generativity is this idea of caring and guiding that next generation. And uh, so much of the programs that we've been doing in the past have been very much geared towards peer-to-peer, -peer, older adults working with older adults. Uh, but we've started to really realize that it's important for older adults to also to be those master artists and to share their knowledge, to be an elder in their community and pass on what they know to the next generation. And so we've been doing these work inside uh, uh, apartments, uh, senior apartments, uh, often there are these shelves. These are used for wayfinding, so people can find out all the doors look the same, but they can find the one that belongs to them. Uh, with these shelves, many people end up using them as these life story displays uh, that we've been talking about. Uh, and this is Gene Ship. Uh, Gene was uh, in the military. Uh, he was in the army, and he has this display that he keeps changing and keeps adding to, uh, and, uh, and he has that on display there. And so. We did this thing where we worked with uh, my class and we took the students there and they interviewed these older adults about their shelves and then they made uh, posters and we go, went back 
uh, and the students stood there and they told the stories to the older adults. It's one thing for the older adults to get to tell their stories, but it's totally another when they hear that story being told back to them by a younger person. They feel fully listened to in the generative process, what folklorists call tradition, has been completed at that point. Uh, and that's uh, really uh, important to me. So I'm happy to talk about any of this stuff or even new stuff. Uh, I just really enjoy being here and uh, getting to do this. And I want to thank Potter College. Uh, I want to thank WKU for really all of this builds upon the shoulders of work that I began there in Bowling Green many years ago. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, John. Um, so everyone can feel free again to um, put questions in the chat or um, raise your hand or your Zoom hand. Um, I, John, I can help you with chat questions. Um, I have questions too, but I will try and hold myself back. Um, we already have one in the chat, so I will read that um, and then others can feel free to turn your camera on if you want to, but no pressure. Um, Donna Schulte. Um, who works with us in the Department of Folk Studies and Anthropology, says, I'm intrigued with the dolls. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes, that's my friend Jenny Kander that made the dolls. I, I, I could have told the whole story about her. Jenny Kander, um, she was, uh, she, well, she would freely tell you, she was on these antidepressants and she uh, uh, had an episode and, and went into the hospital and, and uh, she started hallucinating and she saw this, this glittering rat that was sitting on a on a stool next to her, uh, and so at the same time she was reading a Prim magazine, a, a, a doll thing, and so she started making these dolls. The first one was this glittering rat that she had in, from this dream, uh, and then she started making dolls after dolls after dolls after dolls, uh, and they're not just dolls, but they're dolls that have stories, and they're made in a style that she calls primitives. Uh, but they're also reminiscent of dolls that she remembered from her youth as well. Uh, and there's whole stories that go along with them. And so it's just really a, a delightful uh, a delightful thing. She's doing a whole series right now about immigrants uh, and dolls that are telling the immigrant stories uh, and trying to, to make, uh, uh, to help use her dolls to break down walls uh, that way. So what other questions you got? Thank you, Donna. No questions? Well, I will jump in. I know that there will be others as well. Um, but I will, if you don't mind, John, we'll ask yes, a please. question. Um, I'm wondering about with, um, I believe it was Marion Sykes, um, the, the rug hooker. Um, you were saying that she was describing, you know, the misery of little Italy and of her childhood. And I just wondered how much of, of the memory objects maybe in particular are focused on, you know, happy memories, sad memories, nostalgia, you know, what kinds of, because I think my, my immediate, if I didn't know more about your work, my immediate thought would be, oh, it would be happy memories, right? But when she says it was miserable, I just, it made me wonder. Well, uh, I, I think that she was she was saying it was miserable, but she was there was a certain coyness uh, to that as well. It was oh, it was miserable. We all lived through it, type of thing. That that was just her. Uh, but she was, I mean, she was basically abused in, in an orphan orphanage. She tells these horrific stories about uh, beatings that she, she received and about rich people bringing toys to the kids on Christmas morning and they get all these toys and then the nuns coming through and taking all those toys away to sell them, to buy them shoes uh, and the like. Uh, and so she, and I asked her about those horrible memories and she says, I could probably make a, a rug about the orphanage, but I never have. She goes, it, it would take a long time. I, I, I'd probably have to live to be 200 years old before I would come become basically that desperate to make a quilt about that. Uh, and so it is about being in those kind of fond memories. But then there's Gus Potoff, who's doing these horrific, you know, he's got scenes of, of, of the, with these ghosts of, of, the, of his fallen uh, co-workers on, on the bridge behind him, uh, looking down on him, and, and stories about burying his, his friend in a, in a shallow grave, and, uh, and the all-seeing eye of God looking down, judging him when he steals food. Uh, and so it's some really hard 
things. But his point is he wants people to know these stories. So there's multiple things happening in these. Sometimes they're about uh, filling your time with positive, happy times and moments. Uh, and then sometimes they're about uh, leaving this legacy and telling these st important stories that people need to hear so that they won't forget. So what other questions? I think there were some. Uh, what impacts have you personally left on people as they age and find a deeper meaning of life? Uh, uh, I don't necessarily know that I... Uh, it's all anecdotal at this point. I haven't gotten to the point. I want to find a good uh, uh, medical gerontologist that I could work with that could actually um, work with me to kind of come up with a way to really test uh, test some of these things that we've been doing. Uh, but I think that uh, I think that the impacts have been uh, anecdotally very positive. Uh, just the artists that we work with uh, continue to tell us how. Uh, how meaningful it is for us to 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 come in and to work uh, to work with them. The work that we've been doing at Beltrays, uh, I've received several emails from older adults uh, saying how much they've missed uh, my students being able during COVID uh, being able to come and be be with them. So I think that generativity part is there. Uh, maybe Ann, maybe you can read some of those in that um, while you're pre prepping for that. Maybe Erica can. She's got her hand up. You're muted. You're muted. There you are. Well. Okay, there we go. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say how proud we all are of you, John. Thank you. Uh, John was, I take no credit for the excellence of his work, but uh, he was a remarkable student to have here, and he's gone on to done to do remarkable work. So thank you for that. I um, did I, take a, 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 a folklore and health or uh, the yeah. class that you took, and that was very you know that introduced me to Barbara Meyerhoff and a whole area. So that was very impactful on me. So yeah. thank and you I'll be, for that. I'll be teaching that class for the last time in the fall. So uh, people should little, take it. That's a little ad, but I I wanted to add something that has interested me uh, for for a long time, but I've never done any work with, uh, which is a kind of reversion to skills and uh, behaviors that are childhood behaviors uh, as a, a, a senior pastime. Uh, when I was finishing my dissertation at Indiana, I had to go back and forth uh, from Cape Girardeau to Bloomington, and I had to do it by bus. And that was an 18 to 20 hour undertaking. But I met some really interesting people. And one of the people I met, one of my, my seatmates, was an older lady who would go from town to town to uh, primarily black schools. And she had a whole suitcase full of dolls. And they were generic dolls. They were mostly African-American dolls, but they weren't all. Uh, but they represented figures in African-American history, whom she would dress up uh, as historical figures. And this was her vehicle for talking about these historic characters to young children. And I'll never forget that. I wish that I had followed up on that. Uh, and it reminded me of work that I did in the French community in Missouri and also in the Southwest of the immense pleasure that especially women take in dressing the uh, Roman Catholic um, figures in the churches, you mm -hmm. know, according to seasons or uh, then the infant of Prague, who's a very favorite uh, devotion, um, is often a baby doll and right. will get passed on you know, from older woman to older woman. And her job will be to make a new little outfit. And it's, um, it's, it's very seasonal. And it's very pleasurable, but it's also extremely competitive. And uh, I wondered whether you'd ever come across that kind of secondary skill where you're not creating, you're creating an enhancement or a setting that is 
a little different from creating a quilt or a carving or something like that. Yeah, the, the whole kind of a symbolage type of thing of mm. bringing, bringing things together. I, I mean, I see that with, with uh, uh, sides of barns that turn into museums uh, where they hang up all the tools and that type of thing so that they can talk about those things. I think dolls, as you said, is a, is a great example uh, of that. I think that there there is something about the things that you collect when you're young that you have that 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 maybe get thrown in the back of a closet throughout your life, but then take on new meaning uh, when you reach that retirement age for some some reason. I don't know how many people that talk about, oh, I did this when I was 11, 12, 13 years old, and then now that I'm retired, I'm going to do this again, uh, going back to craft. So there is this idea of great gulfs between, and I think that's one of the the powers of the apprenticeship program in, in folk arts programs is the fact that we we won't many times we won't live long enough to see the seeds that we've sown uh, through that type of work. The idea that we expose people to things and then they're going to emerge uh, uh, many years later. So uh, I, I'm sure we could have long, long conversations about that. And what other questions do we have? So, John, I'll read. Um... First, um, there's a Bowling Green question that I'll come back to and see if others have thoughts on. Um, but Laura McGee writes an observation, but perhaps you can respond. The idea to encourage visual creativity to support the narratives about memory is so powerful. I can imagine that this engages the recipients of the story so much more effectively. It makes complete sense. The craft and creating aspect provides an opportunity for older people to engage in a skill they are very good at, to repeat it and vary on it. So that's a comment, but she thought you might have more to say on that. Definitely, definitely. I think that the fact that they're, it's something that can fill the time and they get into the state of flow uh, where time just passes. I mean, boredom is one of the, the major plagues that uh, the older adults have, and it becomes a, a tool for that. Uh, and also it becomes a way for them to edit and change things. The number of times people make stuff uh, that is almost parodies of the thing that they're making, or they change up, uh, they change it up to, uh, Marianne was all constantly uh, taking things and changing it uh, in that so that she wasn't just changing the image, she was changing the story. Uh, and, you know, we very much live in a, a day and age where we're all about we, we want to change the narrative. We want to change what people are talking about. And older adults have been doing that for a long time. They've been changing the narrative uh, through editing and foregrounding the things that they want to talk about uh, through these objects. So good comment. Great. I don't know if mine was or not. I think it was. <laughs> so we have another great comment here from Yvonne Pepkus. Um, she says, you mentioned discussing memory and mastery with some groups, and I wonder how mastery is defined in this context. I imagine that each person's way into their memory and when it feels right is so particular that what form these are given and the skill sets, including mastery of those skills, would be quite different even in a similar medium. So how is that approached in the groups you've led? Right. Um, being a folklorist, one of the things that I very conscious of is the fact that I don't get to be, or I shouldn't get to be uh, the arbiter of mastery. Uh, but I do believe that everyone strives to feel, there's a great desire to feel that you've mastered something, you know. Uh, why do people mow the lawn uh, in nice little neat straight rows so that it leaves that pattern there? Why, why did my grandfather, when he planted his beans he'd lay out lay everything out with a line before and measure everything he could have just dropped the seeds into place and and it would have grown just the same uh but there was a sense of the right way to do things and when i so when i'm talking about mastery i'm not not necessarily talking about big mastery like the ma mastering painting although it could be that uh but i think this the the sense of feeling that you've done something well and you've done it in a way that is meaningful to you and you want to share that meaning with others. To me, that's the idea of, of mastery. And I think looking at folk arts, uh, one of the, the things that happens with a lot of the creative aging work happens is the fact that we bring in experts to come in and to teach the older adults. A lot of our work is really about saying, wait, 
you all are already masters. You already know the stories. You already know the songs. You already know uh, know this uh, this work. Uh, if you don't, you can learn stuff, uh, and we can help you with this. But it's it's uh, trying to get them. Uh, I think I've wandered probably from the actual question. Uh, but we're trying to get at this idea of mastery as something that someone experiences, not that they obtain. Can I add a follow, ask a follow up question, um, sure. particularly because um, there are some some folks who are less familiar with with um, public folklore and folk arts, um, as well as some of our students. So when you mentioned master and apprentice programs, can you because that's a sort of different but similar yes. use of master if you could. Just explain that a little bit. That would be great. We have a here in Indiana and also in Kentucky. You all have uh, we have an apprenticeship program where a master artist applies to work with an apprentice, somebody that from their community to teach their traditional art to that next generation. So we've worked with ballet folklorica dancers. We've worked with um, uh, blacksmiths. We've worked with um, African American drum making. We, all different types of art forms uh, and. Uh, the master artist takes on an apprentice for a year uh, to teach them uh, their skill. And we pay the master artist. We give the apprentice resources for uh, our money for, for tools that they made, an instrument or, or some, a loom or whatever. Uh, we give them some money so that they can, we can make that, that transmission of knowledge happen. Uh, and it needs to be, we're, we have external reviewers and it's reviewed on, uh, the community participation. So when we do this, it's not just about the individual artist and the apprentice. We're investing in that, but usually those practices are rooted in community life. And so we're actually supporting the community by supporting those artists uh, is, is how we view it. So that's traditionally what a, an apprenticeship program in a folk arts uh, organization does. Thank you. Other questions? So another question in the chat um, is from Roxanne Spencer, whether there are similar programs for senior citizens here in Bowling Green. And she says these are wonderful programs. So I don't know if anyone in the in the audience has an answer to that. Welcome. I would dare say that if you called your local area agency on aging, they would be able to tell you about arts and crafts programs in your community if you're looking to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest to say that I think our program is one of the few that do specifically this type of community-based uh, vernacular traditional uh, tr traditional arts work. Uh, having said, uh, said that, I was just talking with uh, Ann and Bryn about how the thing I've missed about doing this online because of the pandemic is I don't get to come to Bowling Green and see my friends and to uh, eat barbecue. Uh, so if you all wanted to host one of these at a local senior center or something, I'd be thrilled to come and facilitate one for y'all. Yeah, that would be a fabulous follow-up to do next year. We'll give you a month or two off from your WKU <laughs> duties and have you uh, come back. <laughs> I do get summers off as faculty at WKU, right? <laughs> right. You do. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Well, I appreciate everyone. I know I, I talked for a long time, so uh, I really appreciate uh, all of your support and your interest. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. And I also just want to say, getting to engage, you know, you would think uh, I'm at a similar folklore program uh, at, at IU. Uh, but really, it's the opportunity to kind of sit down with your colleagues, especially during the pandemic, to talk about these type of ideas are, are fairly limited. Uh, and so I've just really loved this past month of being able to uh, come and to talk with Brent and Ann and Kate and uh, the two Tims uh, and, uh, and everybody. It's just been uh, really good. And John, you probably can't see the accolades you're getting in the chat as well. Um, it's oh. been a very compelling um, talk, as we knew it would be. 
So thank, thank you very you much, very much for joining us again. Let, let me ask a question of Brent here. Uh, Brent, I know I did a, a much more detailed talk about public programs and the, and creative aging and what people tying it to sociability and, and some of the stuff I really glossed over in this. They recorded that and I know that that's available on the WKU uh, Folk Life Gathering website. Uh, can you make that available to, to more people or was that just for participants? No, no, John, that's that's great. Um, yes, um, Joel actually just, um, Joel and Ellie or Joel sent the, all those um, those talks and those links to those talks out. So maybe we can, if, we are, if we're still on here a couple minutes, maybe, I don't know if Joel can get it or I'll try to grab it and we can do that. So, and so if these are chat. ideas that you want, you can you can download that video or you can stream it and watch that. And I talk a lot more about sociability and, and I'm not just talking about the life story art. It's really art, a much bigger story uh, in that. And it's very much geared towards doing public programs because it was for community scholars. You know, John, something I would be uh, also a little more interested in is impact for all of the participants, um, the students especially, who talk to these older adults about their work, um, what impact that had in their development as folklorist. Uh, I, uh, well, I should say that we've just um, we've just been doing the part with the students for about three, four years now, uh, and. I can honestly say I, I just I hear back from students more so often now uh, since I started doing the work with Bell Trace, the reviews for my classes have gone through the roof as far as evaluations. So they just really love that experience and so many younger people uh, because of you know, modernity has basically loosened the bonds of communities to where elders don't necessarily right. hold the same role that they once did. And so one of the things, uh, consequences is the idea that many younger people are raised without grandparents. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have older people in their lives. And I've had students come up and say, you know, I was really scared of older people. I was, I did, I'd never been around when it was just kind of scary. And this was, it, it kind of changed the way they looked at uh, right. a whole segment of our population. So it's really also worked to help fight ageism uh, in our in our culture. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So good to see you. It's good to see you. <laughs> you and the link, Thank the you. link to the talk that that John mentioned is in the chat. Um, and just as a reminder, I know we all have a million things going on. So if you you if anybody knows folks who wanted to be here tonight, it won't be. This recording will be um, on the PCAL website at the, the same place where you found the Zoom link. So feel free to share that and then we can rally around getting John to come back later to do <laughs> to do a program. Another great. trip. Yes. <laughs> More barbecue. Right. <laughs> we can do that. So well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you again to John. Thanks to PCAL. Kelly Scott unfortunately could not be here um, tonight, but thanks to her as well for, for helping get this coordinated. But thank you very much, Anne. Thank you, WKU, and thank you, Potter College. Uh, uh, just really great that they're doing this, and I've, I've friended them on Facebook, and I encourage you all to do that as well, because uh, they're doing some some great things. Excellent. Well, everyone have a wonderful evening, and there's a weekend coming up. There might be sunshine, so enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, y'all. Thank you so much.